So we're here in Chateau Relaxo, Ronnie. Chateau Relaxo, that's right. This so is the. This uh, is where the magic happens. So you know, you've, how long you been here now? Ten years, I that's think. That's it. It seems like that was when I first came here. It was ten years ago. Has it been only ten? I years? think maybe ten or twelve, maybe okay. the most. But I mean, we've had so many change. You know, I was just talking to Lisa the other day. I said, you know, because <clears throat> of course we're always wanting to go up and go somewhere else or do whatever. I've adopted Costa Rica as my second home. And the part I like about Costa Rica is the fact that it's an ocean and a jungle and it's like a desert. All within a 20 minute circumference. Wow. So I can get my surfing done. I can go in the jungle I can have the nature like we do in the desert yeah you know and then you have desert there's desert there too right. I just had a record come out with the distillers last month which the distillers was is a punk rock band right and they were on epitaph with us together and I played on their record and it was like that record's been I mean it's been making a little bit of money over the 20 years or whatever now they just did a 20-year release with you know a limited amount and you know it was sold out in a couple of weeks and they sold like 5,000 of them you know what I mean right right so maybe they'll do another re-release of it or something but that was just the propaganda and then I just saw that they did a Christmas concert so everything leads to something right right so they brought out the record that made them popular then they come out with a Christmas show right yeah who would you know <laughs> and then people are buying all the merch on shop yeah and for now, that's good for bands. I mean, it's on the up, man. I mean, I, I can't, I can't say that the pandemic has hurt me at all. And it may be just my outlook on the thing. I know, yeah. I know we lost hundreds of thousands of dollars not being able to tour this summer. Right, right. But it's like, you don't count, you don't count the money before you get it anyway. So it right. never really was there. Right, yeah. I mean, it yeah. was there. Right. But it's not there. Right. Anyways, I come to find out that I was being rejuvenated and regenerated and, and just <clears throat> renewed when I'm there. Right. I come back to LA and I'm like the freshest dude in the meeting. You know, everybody <laughs> yeah. else is so broke, you know, just yeah. and I'm like, man. Okay, and every time I like kind of go there again, then I'm like, oh, I need a Costa Rica trip. So it is like it's like a yeah, it's like a refreshing thing. So then I got involved with some universities through all this stuff, blah 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 blah. Just fast forward meeting and getting a bunch of resources. Um, I wrote a song with one of their big artists that became a national theme song for the country. We were on uh, Dancing with the Stars and everything this last year yeah. um, and I got involved with these universities and the universities wanted me to sit on their board of directors and talk about how music regenerates people's souls you know right. basically right. and I'm a, I'm a jazz fanatic so jazz has always been a way that I think for me and for musicians in general I think if you're a musician you love jazz right and you sit there and you may not know how to do it, but you can sit there and respect respect it and chill out with it and respect the level of musicianship and, and, and you're, re, you're rejuvenating right. your mind, maybe even being uh, challenged to want to do it, but it's not even that. It's just you're going like, I'm a musician. These guys are musicians too. Right. I don't play this kind of music, but I love it. It's Freshens me, eh? right. so that's what Costa Rica does for me. Yeah, and the improvisational part of jazz, I mean, that's that takes a lot of thought and a lot of uh, mindfulness. Being mindful, yeah. right? Being in the moment because it comes and goes. Being in, so, the, yeah, moment. Being in the moment, exactly. And that's, and that's regeneration, right. you know, just to be able to be in that. And they did it in very natural places, you know. They would, they would, uh, you know, even in little clubs, they wouldn't be playing big stages. They'd be like all helping each other do this thing, you right, know, right. and very tight knit. So that's my jazz, basically. Costa Rica's my jazz. The desert's my jazz, yeah. man. So I sit on a board of directors for a 
uh, university, Universidad uh, de Cooperation, uh, Co Cooperation International, which they gave me a Goodwill Ambassador post. So basically what I do with them is I go in and we do seminars and talk about music and talk about how that is a part of farming, how it's a part of everything. Right. And I tell you, man, I go out here to the date grows riding my bike and everything, and all of a sudden you hear the guy singing. The guy cutting the trees is singing. And then you go over to the other guy down way over, not even by that guy, and he's singing. These guys are out in nature, and they're out singing while they work, man. Right, yeah. And they do that in Costa Rica too, dude. Yeah. They just, the, the, the people, you know, and I think us as Americans need, need to understand the Latin culture a little bit better. Um, and your Spanish is getting better, I bet. Yo trato. <laughs> yo trato español. Uh, yo escucha mejor. Poco a poco. Si. I, I can hear it better, but to speak it is yeah. still a little. I can speak it if I'm just saying yeah. something. How about you and Alejandro Taranto? Alejandro. A great friend of yours. And he is, he, he's teaching me a lot of Spanish. He's uh, primarily Spanish speaking. So yes. what's that like when you and him are together? Because I've seen him alone. I've seen you alone. <laughs> I've never seen you guys communicate. What's that like? Cause I got to turn it's to It's good. My... I get better. Yeah. I get better. Because his English is about the same place as my Spanish. <laughs> yeah. So we start talking Spanglish together. But then by the end of the night, I'm like, how do I say this again? Yeah, yeah. And he goes, oh, you say it like this. And then he'll say, What's, what is it actually in English? And yeah, yeah. so we, I mean, the more we're together, the more both of our languages are getting better. Yeah. Alejandro, I met him in Argentina uh, through a friend of mine, Luciano Jr., who is in the Los Fabulosos Cadillacs. And great band. Great band. we met, and the rest is history. I mean, we've been friends. They would come like once a year and come and visit, visit, visit. And he's like, Ronnie, I want to come. I want to be back in L.A. He was a big record executive in Miami and in L.A. for Warner Brothers. And God bless his soul, Romolo. They're having his funeral today. And it's the weirdest thing. It's a, a real big PR guy um, that I met years ago. And he's like, you got to meet Maricela. You got to meet her. And so like for a year, he's just, we'd go to the Latin Grammys together. And this guy was the great one of the old and the, the last of the great PR guys, mm. especially in the Latin community, man. Right. He'd get you in any door. This cat was hot. Anyway, he just died last week. Mm. Heart attack. But anyways, so Mar Maricela goes, dude, we're making the record this year for Romolo, dude. He didn't put us together for us not to really make a record. Yeah. So about three months ago, three or four months ago, we got together and we wrote basically, I don't know, 12 songs, 13 songs. Yeah. Gonna, we're gonna pick out like three or four of them and then we're gonna write some other things. So we're gonna make that record That's with her. Great, man. She's great. fantastic. She's the Latin Madonna and I'm her little David Foster. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm David Foster, she's Celine Dion. Yeah. And we're just gonna do that. Grand piano with Whitney Houston. Grand piano with Celine Dion. I mean, but it's yeah, yeah. Ronnie King and Maricela. Right. It's we're not reinventing the wheel, but right. we have such a and we connected musically was fantastic. Right. And we both looked at each other and went, man, we're, this is really meant to be. There's no doubt about yeah. it. So we're working, Alejandro's producing that with us. Um, and I'm, man, I've got a Sounds of Tamarindo that I, I, when I was in Costa Rica, I would go and I would take artists and I would take them to my tree house. And uh, we would record in my tree house in the jungle. <laughs> And so we had the monkeys everywhere, and they're singing. So I've got like 14 songs, and we're calling it The Sounds of Tamarindo, because they were it was all recorded in the beach community I live in. And it's all just the locals, and it's fun. We've got Robert August, the, the great surfing uh, shaper, older dude. He, he was in the movie um, Endless Summer, big cult surfer film. Yeah. He lives in Tamarindo. Anyways, he's on it talking about how cool it is to be in this tree in the tree house. So I've been doing it different places. I would do it in the tree house. I'd record the record on the beach. I would go like just in the jungle or we would ride horses and then I would set up my portable gear and the guy just play the guitar and the thing. So uh, that's coming out this year too. So there's gonna be a lot of Latin American 
for me, um, definitely because I've been kind of like, I could travel right now, but I'm just not feeling it. Yeah. For me. Right. You know, pandemic, not a pandemic. Well, I don't even know. It, it yeah. doesn't really matter to right. me. You're a shapeshifter is what you are. You I'm a shapeshifter. Shape yeah. You just like, you know, kind of the environment doesn't really dictate uh, what you're doing. But it, yeah. at the same time, you know where you are, Costa Rica, the desert. Yeah. You, you feed off of that too. Yeah. I mean, I never had it. Nothing was ever handed to me. So I always had to shape shit. Yeah. I mean, when I did my first record with Easy E, dude, I sh I don't know. I hope I looked black because everybody. <laughs> how, every, how old were you when you did that? How old were you? Oh, I think I was in. It was uh, 1992, so I was like in my mid 20s, 26, 27, maybe. And I I must have shape shape shifted then because they were like. I know they wanted to say who's the white boy in the room, but at the, <laughs> or the same el the white elephant in the room. Yeah, like who's <laughs> this dude? But they knew all about me before because right. I was with Jerry Heller. So it was like, okay, Jerry must have some plan for him. Right. And then I went on tour with this kid Timmy T. So we blew up so quick on one single, and then. We used to have to walk through Jerry's office to get to Maury Alexander, who was managing this Timmy T guy. And they would all just look like, who's the white boy? I had my brother Bobby, we, we were together. Yeah. We had long hair, we, they used to call us the Nelsons because we had like long hair, real heshy. <laughs> yeah. And Nelson. we would walk by and they would be corrupt dads. I mean, it would be like the most notorious, you know, rappers in LA. And then we'd walk right by and then we would end up in Maury's office and we were they were cutting checks because this kid had number one you know yeah, yeah so it was like okay this is what we're doing we're going on tour boys okay uh i'm like can the bus come and pick me up from my apartment they're like <laughs> yeah. not a problem <laughs> when that bus pulled up to that little shitty apartment you know and that first check was in and i was like i like this yeah. I like I like where this is going. And we did the tour and it was fantastic. We played Disneyland's and like grad nights. We did every T V show there was from Rick D's, that was a big one. We yeah. did the Tonight Show. We did, we did Yeah, I remember Rick D's. <laughs> I remember Rick, Rick D's. Yeah. Yeah. And I I met him later at a dinner party right here in the desert, dude. I'm like He walked in and he was doing his Rick D's thing, had yeah. this leather black leather jacket from the 80s straight up <laughs> i walked out of the bathroom i'm like you're rick t's yes i am I said, dude i played on your show with timmy t dude and my hair obviously was different yeah yeah and we chopped it up i said yeah man that was like the funnest she was he was a good interviewer yeah and and, and the operation was very chill and everybody was good so anyways i knew then that's what i wanted to do and uh, the rest is really history. Coachella made a lot of money in this town. Right. They could have made it big, like, I'm a unionized guy. I belong to the Musicians Union, 47 in Los Angeles. I've been a member mm. since 1990. I get a pension. I get, like, I, like I'm a fireman. Right. <laughs> I get a pension. I don't, my insurance isn't through that, but I could get insurance. I can get legal advice. I can get a, a lot of stuff. The Musicians Union. Right. That's what it is. It's a union, and they give everybody the opportunity to ask the questions that they don't understand. Right. They do it for the orchestras. They do it for, for, for anybody else. When you go to a concert, all those guys on that stage are union dudes. Part of their pension, they get the pension money, and they get the money that they... But they don't do it for the gig musician. Right. They're a 1099 dude that just go in there. And then pretty soon, I can see why they feel like a victim, because they just yeah. can't get up. Right. And they're not like that little girl who, you know, had that great opportunity, the Ortega girl. Yeah, Jenna. That happens once in a blue moon. Yeah. I mean... That, that just doesn't happen to everybody, right. you know what I mean? Yeah. A lot of us, hey, I haven't even hit my full lick, but I always knew I was a late bloomer anyway. So keep an eye on what we're doing for the next 10 years. I mean, and the one thing you learn when you do make money or you do have fame and all that stuff, you're like, 
man, that surely wasn't exactly what I thought it was going to be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, when I jumped on that stage and I played Budokan with The Offspring, right? I'm thinking, fuck me, and I'm playing Budokan, right? Right. I can die. Lord, strike me down on Budokan stage. Just right. let me put my peace right. sign up and hear the crowd just, ah! Right? It just it came and it went, and then we went to another place. Yeah, and that's yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it and it was like, okay, cool. What do I got? I got a memory and some pictures. Right. Oh, our, Artesia Pro. Yeah, Artesia yeah, Pro. Yeah. Where are they based out of? Uh, they're based out of San Diego. Um, great company. They supply me with keyboards for my live touring. Nice. And uh, yeah, man, you. The simpler, the better when you're touring, man. Yeah. I don't want to plug in a bunch of computers and this and that to do. I want my sounds, plug it in, get up there, do a line check and play. Right. So these keyboards they have are fantastic. The organ and the piano sound are my two kind of go-tos yeah. uh, when I play with Pepper. But what they have that's really cool is they have a grand piano. And that's my next uh, thing that they're going to provide, which is awesome. And then I'm going to have a, one of the big artists from Solon are going to paint it. Oh, nice. Or my buddy Dan will wrap it or something. Right. So that when I'm on stage with Pepper or, or uh, Steel Poles or Big Mountain or whoever, we're going to make this portable grand piano thing. It looks like a grand piano, but it's not. It's right. electronic on the inside. Right. Got but it. it looks cool. So easy to easy to travel. I mean, easy to travel. Pull the legs yeah. off. Boom, boom, boom. It's gonna be my own custom thing. They don't nice. know it yet. Right. But now they know. <laughs> now they know. Now they know that I'm gonna make it a portable thing. Right. Have you ever done any, anything like that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> diva, some diva shit like that. Oh my <laughs> god. Sad to say, but yes. And it was right here in the Coachella Valley. Oh, yeah. May I expound? But please. I, I, I pride myself on my transparency. <laughs> Ronnie's real, a human as well. Go ahead, Ronnie. Okay, let me, uh, let me get a nice swig of this beautiful beer we have, La Quinta yeah. Brewery. Thanks to La Quinta Brewery. Let's, uh, let's cheers to Ronnie King's transparency. Of, did, did, have cheers. I ever had a diva moment yes. like that? Yeah. I'm going to give you one, and it was right oh, here in nice. the desert. Yeah. So I just get off the road. I don't know who I was with, but I was hyped up, man. I flew in. I even think I flew in private to Palm Springs, right? So I'm hot. <laughs> so my wife meets me at the airport. We go to see my brother John play. And it's when he had his own club. He had his club called King Social Club. King Social Club, yeah. And so he's got the whole band. There's like seven guys on the bandstand, right? They were all playing acoustic music or whatever. Okay. So anyway, so John, like my, I love my brother. He's like, hey, bro, you want to get up and jam with us? And I'm already three sheets to the wind. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I just got off the plane. I'm, I'm feeling froggy. I said, okay, great. Yeah, I'm sure, man, bro. And I get up there and I sat on the piano and I started playing. You know, and, and I, I thought, you know, he wanted the band to play around me is what I thought. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And if you know my brother, John. Right. No one. Yeah. No John, one, he doesn't no, play around anyone. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's the John King show. Right. Which he's a great band leader like that. I yeah. mean. It's his club, too, by the way. Just yeah. Remember, and it's just his club. And my parents and my wife. Yeah. And everybody's in the club, and I'm up there, and so I'm thinking the band's supposed to play around me. So I'm playing, and I'm looking at the guys, and I'm like, these guys just aren't getting it, man. The bass player was all over the freaking place, and I'm like, and then at, then at some point I riled myself up so bad, like I didn't I didn't even know what song I was playing at this point. <laughs> and I'm looking at John, John's looking at me, and I and, and he kind of gives me that brother look, like, yeah. bro. Come on, over the top, bro. Yeah, you're you're lo you're losing it. Yeah, you're losing it. You're you know, yeah. and instead of me just going, you know, I, I got to walk off, guys. I decide I'm going to start yelling at the band while we're playing. Oh shit! <laughs> what are you guys not playing? What? What the fuck? You know, you're not playing with me, man. I'm. Yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> and I just see everybody in my family just going, wow, this guy's coming yeah. unglued. <laughs> and I was, I, I was, on, I mean, I, you know, like I told you at the beginning of the story, everything like that. Oh, geez. So we get off that train wreck and John <laughs> just looks at me and he's like, bro. But he's done it a million times oh, too. Yeah. We'll have him on here and I'll have him show. Oh, him. he'll chat. Oh, I, I was with him even not long ago, a year ago or so. I'm, I'm, I'm pleading the fact that it happened like 12 years ago or 15 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. That's when I was a little more, right. not as calm. <laughs> Anyways, I get off the stage and I go sit with my wife and my wife is just boiling and she just looks at me and she goes, bro, you just embarrassed the whole freaking family, the whole, I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah. They weren't playing with me, you know, and I was trying to justify the whole right. thing. So I had to apologize. I did apologize. But I, you know, I had just, I don't know. Yeah, I, were, I might have flew in from here. I don't know, remember exactly what was happening, but I was hot. Yeah, you were coming out of a Rocky movie, ready to like. Yeah, I was like, just like. Hype, man. Yeah, and I was just hyped, and I thought I was for some reason, and I, you know, probably, I, I, well, I did. I had libations. And, right. Uh, whatever. <laughs> Plural. On the so, album. but the, the main point was, I thought the band was supposed to be playing with me. Right. And that's where the whole problem started. <laughs> and I think Richie Michaels was even on stage and I was so embarrassed. I called each one of the guys like, dude, I'm sorry. And Richie Michaels used to play with Rufus and Shaka Khan and, you know, all these big bands. And I was just like, oh, dude, you lost it on that one. But it doesn't happen often. Right. I don't think it's happened really since, I don't think. For me. But yeah, I did have a diva moment then. I probably had more. Yeah. But that was one clearly. I, and by the way, if ever, whoever's alive that was on that bandstand in the audience, I'm sorry. So hey, uh, <laughs> let, let's talk a little bit about the artists that you worked with that are from here or come here and kind of like uh, call this a second home. People like Kelly Derrickson, Kristen uh, Lee, uh, you know, Derek Jordan Gregg. Yeah. Uh, who else? Who else am I missing? I mean, you've worked with all the reggae artists here, like RB Junctions. Yeah. Um, Tribe O. Yeah, Mikey Reyes. Yeah, Mikey Reyes. Like, you you know, you've kind of... And well, this, is, this is what kind of picking off what I talked about earlier outside about how you still give back and you still uh, do your best to to keep the community together yeah i'm a jam dude i love yeah. people coming over and it's always not about you know what the next move is and you know <clears throat> it's like tarver tarver just called me right now hey bro i got this guy he plays bowls hey i gotta record him man i, I got it he's only here for one more week and he get over here i'm like Shh, come on you know it's like you know the homies gotta come have some too you know what i mean because that that keeps my thing together but yes um all of those artists that you mentioned, uh, Derek, um, and just recently Matt Claiborne. Matt Claiborne. Um, Kelly Derrickson. Um, she's Rasan. Rasan, yeah. Um, so many other other artists too. I just had Sergio Vendejas was here. Jimmy Fitz. I had him. I I well, and he's said this in many times in interviews, but. I basically dusted that dude off, man, from the 80s. Yeah, yeah. yeah hey, audio, <laughs> video. Great, yeah. Great song. Dude, I used to lay up by and watch that on MTV, dude. I knew. Yeah. And then Jimmy's like, that's me, dude. I'm like, no. I get chills even still. We were just in the car. And he's like, yeah, dude, I had this big hit, audio, video. I'm like, no. Yeah. I'm an 80s kid. That's my right. high school. I used to watch that on MTV all the time, man. It's it was a big, big video, yeah. But... He's, he, he, he comes to me, he's like, Ron, I want to get back. And he said this many times, so I'm not saying anything out of school. And he's like, I want to get back in the music business. I know you did, 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 but. So I'm like, well, come over to the studio, man. It's just like that. It's like, yeah. come over. We had the best night. We had a bottle of Jack <laughs> and he flushed. We call this the flush, flush out studio. Come, stay, sleep on the floor if you want, but you're gonna flush your talent and you're gonna right. flush yourself out. And all those artists you talked about, yeah. that's what we've always done with them, yeah. is, is have them come over and have them get used to what they're doing. And the new right. sound, Matt Claiborne, he goes, Ronnie, I've never made an electronic record like this, but I know I wanna do it. Right. 
can we get there? I'm like, of course. You, you give me some examples of what you want to do, right. and I can totally do it. And we did. We, we, he's very happy. I'm happy. But yeah, Jimmy Fitz came over, and we played bongos all night. I still have the originals, which I have threatened <laughs> him that I would put those out at some point. I want to see Fitz on bongos. I want to see that. I want to see the video. Is there he, a video? Dude, I got video. I got recordings. Of Audio, him. video. Dude, he sat there and played the guitar and was so, I'm like, and my wife came to, from downstairs and she watch, just watched him and went, was mesmerized. Yeah, he's a, he's like, mo he's a force, man. That, dude, that guy. he was in the right place. The studio was the right place for him. Yeah. Um, we were both in the, you know, he sat with us on the boat and he's like, I want to get back into this thing. So anyways, so then I turn him on to Lewis Richards over at 17th Street Louis, Studio. Louis. And we go over there and I helped produce some of the first, the first record, right? And as we were recording it, I basically saw that all slip away. <laughs> <laughs> I loved what he did that first night. Yeah. You know, and I've told him and I've told Richard too, you know, I've, I, I'm like that night was, he was so in the zone that like, I would really like to do a record with him again Yeah. and just doing just him with that guitar. And however I got him in that space, I want him to go back there. Right. We've done great records before and they're awesome records and they're doing great things and they're serving everything. Yeah. But, uh, I, 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 that night was special for me, and I think it was special for him yeah, as well. That's great. And the, one of the first times I came here um, was uh, you invited me because the Yip Yops were recording here. Yeah, and, all uh, the Yip Yops. Yeah, and when you talk about you know that the flush, I mean, I remember being here. Yeah. And you were just you were just getting them to keep pushing, pushing themselves. Yeah. And um, you know, and the kids are great. I mean, they're great kids. Well, kids are resilient. Yeah, and they just know. kept pushing and pushing, and like you yeah. know, I saw the flush. Mm -hmm. You know, it's pretty cool to see. So, um, yeah, this is you know, it's. Uh, That's is, what this is, you know. And like I say, I got a call from a big management company in in L.A. I don't know who they were, but they were like, "Hey, do you got a got an equipment list, or do you have a this, and do you?" Yeah, it's not made for that. And the minute, it's kind of like. Anything that you defile, you can never bring it back. <laughs> Pretty much. Right. I mean, if this place gets too right. embellished, right. Th then I think even for me, I'm, it, we call it the blowout. Right? So like this is the next thing that I thought was going to be cool is to like make a little podcast studio thing. Right. right. right? It's, it's a natural progression, you know, and I feel good about it and there's people around me feel good about right, it right. and that's it. But if I just come in here and bring $150,000 worth of recording gear and I put it in here, I, I think it's going to mess me up and I think it's going to mess the integrity of it. But once you blow it out, you can never, I can't, you can never go back to that initial raw, you know, feeling of things, you know, so... You know, but every, hey, I got everything you need. And, it, and I always say, if you can't do it here, dude, you can't do it. Yeah. Pretty much. Makes sense. And you know, it goes back to that organic, has to be, happen organically. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. But you can't, you know, make something that's not supposed to be. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think the place provides that. Like, you know, a lot of guys, man, I had Mellow Man Ace over here one time. And he's like, he came in here, he's like, Okay, you know, you know the, 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 the artists that I deal with on, on real high levels, they've been in a lot of studios, man. Right. So they walk into here and they go, wow, like all this, all this stuff's gonna work? <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, but it reminds me of my garage when I was a kid, man. Yeah. Yeah. You know, playing with the four track. Hey, I wrote some great songs on the four track that later went to go to the Joy Killer. I mean, yeah. you know what I mean? So it's like, and I'm, and I'm doing a song I wrote, I got two songs on Latoya London's new record, who was one of the three divas on American Idol. Okay. It was Fantasia, uh, Jennifer Hudson, and Latoya London. And they were called the three divas because they were battling back and forth. This was like eight or nine, 10 years ago, maybe. Right. I played with her so many times and was in the studio with her, but she called me to do some new stuff with her. She came over here and we recorded all the demos and stuff. And now she's going back to the big studio, you know, to, yeah. to do or whatever, right. whatever. 
we we like the comfortableness. Yeah, it serves its I'm purpose, saying. right? I mean, it's serving its purpose. And then she says, "Hey, you got any songs?" <laughs> I'm like, Psh, "I got a song that I think would be great for you. I wrote it like 20 years ago. I played it for her, and it's on the new record." Nice. Yeah. Nice. Bro. But you see what I'm saying? I mean, it's like songs, life, journey. You know, it all it's all going to play itself out, right. you know, for what it's supposed to be, you know. And I know for me in the Coachella Valley, I want nothing more than to to not only give back to my community cuz I'm a little kid from freaking <coughs> Southside Indio. Right. I get it. And I don't live too far from where I grew up, you know, right. really. Right. And I every time I drive back by there, man, the house looks tiny. <laughs> I'm like, how did my parents get seven What's, kids? What street was it on? Jackson, right by the Poly Pool. Jackson by Poly Pool. Okay, so yeah. On right. the frontage road. Okay. So, okay. Do you remember the Brigados? They were a Filipino family. Dang, that sounds familiar. Well, they live right around across the, from the back. Right across from the boys' club. So. Okay, they were down that way. Yeah, so you're okay. closer to Jackson? I'm on the frontage road on Jackson. Oh, that's right. Yeah, then you wouldn't, yeah. Okay. Well, they're over there. Right. And believe you me, that was a long trek from our house to the boys' club because we yeah. were all boys' club guys. Right. But you were for sure going to get in a fight or two just on to get to the right. boys' club. Right, right, right. <laughs> No doubt. I mean, right. I'm not kidding. You yeah. walk through that park, man. You you got to be stay ready, man. Yeah. We had Mecca Vineyards. We had Penn West. Right. right. What was the one in the back? Oh, Mar uh, Vista or some. No, no. You're thinking of a, a cover track. Is it cover track? Carver track? But they mm. called it cover track. It was even no. was called something before then. There's <laughs> the the track that's right by the boys' club. Okay. That one in the back. All those apartments. Okay. It was a big project, yeah. but there was the one across the street. I think that was Mecca Vineyards, maybe. Yeah. Either or. Yeah. Anywhere you went, everybody was converging in the park. Right, right. <laughs> Davis Field. Yeah, right. Davis Field. Yeah. I won. I won pump, pass, and kick there. Oh, did you? Mm -hmm. Wow. I went to the freaking nationals, Dave. Nice, bro. What, what did? What was your specialty? Uh, punting and passing. Okay. Right. You know, as far as our business, entertainment business, yeah, I mean, yeah. there's been very a lot of successful people coming from the desert, man. I mean, just yeah. it's so funny. And what, you were you went to Indio High School. What class did you graduate? Eighty one. Eighty one. Class. We're 81. number one. Eighty one. Okay. And I don't think anybody did anything out of my class. <laughs> were were you in any music programs in high school? All of them. Oh, yeah. I was in everything, man. I was in summer summer uh, theater at the Methodist Church. With Ray, what was his name? Ray something. He was a principal of the school. Um, but yeah, no, I was in all uh, music totally. I mean, uh, when we weren't jamming in our garage, we used to yeah. jam out in the garage for all the neighbors. And that's where I right. kind of got my funk card playing with my brother and all of his older buddies. Yeah. Um, and then I was playing with my brother John in clubs at 14. Wow. So we, we had a, a stint a big stint at the North Shore Yacht Club at the at the Salton Sea. Wow. And my parents used to let me get out of school. It was a Friday night. I was 14 years old. They used to stuff me in this little Datsun truck. So the, the bed is right here, right? And then everybody's, you know, in this part. And they would stuff me in between the gear. I used to <laughs> roll into the gear and like be scrunched in. And then my brother would be driving. And we would get there, you know, we'd start playing at nine. Yeah. And um, frickin' A, dude, we'd go, sometimes we'd go there and, you know, the fog and, but we were like, bro, we got fog lights. Remember, fog lights are a oh, big yeah. deal. And, and my folks let my brother drive. And then we would get out of there at 12 or one and drive back. I mean, my brother John was, he was a renegade. He would drive and, and like a couple of the guys in the band would be in the Datsun truck and we'd pull out. And that was back in the old days. I still had the piano. I, I used that Fender Rhodes yeah. right there. <clears throat> nice. Yep. Yep. Still sits there. The Moog I'm retiring. I'm going to put it in a glass case. Oh, yeah? Mm -hmm. That's the keyboard that did all the Tupac Mariah carries. I mean, really the first part of my career. Nice. I mean, I'd literally go to five sessions a day and I'd be, you know, the rockers like to rock early, especially like the offspring, because they're all business, right? So they're not doing late hours. 
You know what I mean? They get there at 12. Hey, Fred, how you doing? Do, 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 do. No. Bob, Bob Rock's there. Bob Rock don't want to be working past six. You know what I mean? Right. Not in his program. Right. He's too big for that shit. And he don't want to hang in the studio. I don't even know if he likes the studio. It makes great records, though. But anyway, so you'd be, I'd be with the offspring till like six, and I'd get a call from Coolio or something, go over there for a couple, two, three hours. Pac always started late. And I would end up, you know, just going around Hollywood, going to all the different studios, making money, working, making great records. And then I'd have to practice with my band the next day or be with the Epitaph or whatever. You know. How did you sh shift your, your gears going from rock to rap? Like, did, did you mindfully say, okay, um, I have my drive here. Like, did you? How did you? You know what started happening is they both started intertwining each other, and I think that's what both sides wanted at some point. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because I'd come into the, I'd come into death row, and my hair would be blue, and I freaking earrings and <laughs> nose rings. Yeah, there's no more walking by, right? Like you did before. Oh yeah, no, 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 no. They, no, I was well, I was deep in the cut at that time. I'd, I'd been there for years, and you know, I was on the payroll. Let's just say. Right. And um, they knew the crazy white boy was coming in, and he was going to lay it down at that point. Yeah. But um, at that point, it's like I think they wanted that. You know, I always said it was different sides of the same coin. They were both anti-establishment types of music. Right. So that was my thread. Gangsters want to be gangsters. That's it. White punkers just want to be gangsters in a different way, or they want to be anti-establishment or right. whatever. So it was basically the same thing. And then after years of getting hit records with these guys and that sound kind of generating, they kind of both wanted a little bit of each of that. Right. So when I did hit that with the offspring, um, I just remember in the studio session, frickin' Bob Rock and 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 and, uh, and uh, Brian Holland would be like, "Bro, do that Dr. Dre shit, man." <laughs> I'm like, "How am I gonna fit that right. into a punk rock song?" It's like, right. like. I barely said it once. And I was like, okay, no, it's on. I got to make it happen. Right. And then, you know, then at that point, then, you know, you always kind of listen to the room is what I always did. And some guy was, in, I don't even know who the guy was. And he was just like going, bum, 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 bum. he was like singing this little part, you know, I went, okay, okay. So maybe if I just do that, like rock and roll type of part, and then just put the gangster shit to it. And I played that and then Brian's like, yeah, that's it. And then if you hear the song, you'll see how all these elements play into themselves. Right. And they're like, hey, we want the low end bass, dude. And, and I had the Moog and so I was like, ah. And then so then I was like, okay, I'm just gonna copy. Cause the bass was like going, boom, ba da boom, boom, ba da boom, boom, ba da boom, some shit like that. So I just kind of kept developing it or whatever. Right, right. And so anyways, that's another part of the podcast. That's what I'm going to do with my how-to podcast. Yeah. I'm going to show the people how I actually nice. developed those different things and tell stories like that. Yeah, that's like, going to be great. Yeah, that's going to be awesome. Yeah, and it was like, how do they, yeah, how do they bridge together, you know? So, and then I started a band called Punks and Thugs with Big Psych from Thug Life and Mo Prem from Thug Life. And I started recording with Total Chaos and I put the two together. And that was Punks and Thugs. And we did a bunch of soundtracks. We did a, we had a, a bunch of songs on a, a movie or a television. It was called Chromium Blue. We got a bunch of those songs on all that stuff. And then, you know, it was like, oh, how are we going to tour with this? And Total Chaos was touring and Thug Life was touring. You know, so the touring part of it never, but I have so much music even still. And then I was like, okay, I'm going to put a new Punks and Thugs together. So I got Sean Smash. Big Psych, Mo Prem, Ron Welty from The Offspring played drums, and um, who played the bass? I'm forgetting who played the bass. So then I did another infusion of Punks and Thugs, which I still have not released yet anyway either. Then Tim Armstrong hears and he goes, dude, that's, that's amazing. He goes, can you get Mo Prem and Big Psych in the studio? So it was basically, he's got the masters right. for... Big Psych, Mo Prem, and Rancid, and we wrote like three songs. And um, who played the guitar? Oh, 
Oh, you know who played the drums was Adrian Young from No Doubt played the drums on that one. And um, Wayne Kramer. Wow. From uh, MC5. MC5, yeah. Yeah. So Tim even, and Tim hasn't released that either. So hopefully one day. Yeah. You know, there's just a lot of stuff in the, in the world that just hasn't, you know, yeah. been released. But these ideas. So anyway, so I decided to write the, the book. Punks and thugs. Yeah, and before that book comes out, you have another book. Yeah, Ronnie Seven Keys. Basically, it's a um, it's just a, a navigational. Uh, I think there's like ten or thirteen chapters, and it's uh, just different, like kind of workbook ish type of ideas. So maybe one of the questions would be the fork in the road. Yeah, you know, and then I just basically told the story of how I navigated a fork in the road of a major something that happened yeah. for me. And then at the end of it, you know, the person can then therefore write their fork in the road. And then it'll be like, make a, uh, obviously a medium where people can talk to each other. So yeah. maybe I'll make like a web, uh, a social media, something where we'll be like, okay, dudes, we're gonna, let's talk about chapter one. Yeah. And, and, it's educational, I guess, in a yeah. way. But that's basically the first. When's that coming out? Seven Keys. Uh, after the first. I'm right down. I just did the thank yous today. Cool. And Who's uh, writing the forward on that? Well, guess what? I'm trying to get my boy Joe Vitelli. Oh, nice. Yeah. yeah you, you're, you're good friends with that guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I wanted to have it all together, because I quote him in the book, too, as well, later on in the book, on like how to then start you know, affirming you know, things that you're doing and that have worked for me too. And like right. how even the fork of the road, how I, after I saw the chapters go, then I was like, dude, I was doing affirmations and stuff like that and, and projecting the outcome before I even knew what I was doing. Yeah. yeah. You know, Joe just has brought that out in me. Um, but I would like him to do it because he's a musician. He's got over like 14 records or something. Oh, wow. But we talk all the time. And he's cool, man. He's a cool dude. He's like, you know, Uncle Joe, you know? Yeah. But we haven't even got into the meat of it uh, yet as far as business and, and all that we're going to do together. Yeah. He has so many, so many marketing skills. Yeah, he's an inspirational. Man, he's person. amazing. Yeah. And when he calls you and he's just like, right in. what are you doing? You know, and when, when he says, what are you doing? Yeah, that's you a, don't make small talk. It's a loaded that. question. You better be. Honest. Yeah, you better be like, you, tell me exactly what you're doing. You know, when I first met him, we had a, he sat, he, we, we talked for like 10 minutes. I'm like, oh, dude, he goes, yeah, I play music. I play the guitar. Oh, really? You play the guitar? Or whatever. And I was performing at this seminar. So at the end of the whole thing, and he, I just remember him looking at me and sitting and watching me play, play the piano. And when I got done, he pulled me aside, gave me another 10 minutes. He goes, bro, you got to clean your shit up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, what? Clean what up? Right. I'm just, bro, I'm just telling you, you're a very talented dude. I dig you. Clean, clean it up. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I took that home and I was like, clean it up? Yeah. <laughs> and I'll never forget that. And now that I'm seeing his literature and, and I have his books and yeah. talking about cleaning it up, you know, when you're on that stage, you know, you know, you're going to blow him away, but clean it up, yeah. you know, clean up your side of the story, you know, influence people with that music, you know, give them, give them real you don't, don't give them the stuff that you can just go to, right. you know. Be, be there in the moment. That's, then that's, that's what he's saying. Clean up your, right. you know, because he can just tell by me talking to him. Right. I'm like laughing uh, uh, and I'm not really in the conversation with him, but that's Joe Vitelli. Right. He wants to look at you in the eye and say, come on, no, 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 no. There's no, you don't get time off with your words, basically. Right. right. You know, you are what you say. You better be talking these words that always influence people and, and move people, you know. Yeah, that's and I think a lot of us just take a, what words really how powerful words are. Yeah. And we'll be like, maybe I shouldn't tell my kids this because it might hurt their feelings. But right. you got to tell them right. and you got to tell them right then when right. it's fresh. 
right. you know, when it's fresh right. for them. But you got to choose the right words too, and remember your audience, right? Choose the right words, right. and and choose and 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 know them enough to know what yeah. what they can handle. Yeah, you're a dad. I mean, I'm sure in your world, when it's like, God, I hate to say this to the kid, but I got to pull him aside. Right. I got to pull him aside on right. this for sure. For you sure. know, and you give them the right words and the right tone and the. My dad, his right tone was the belt. <laughs> he used to snap that thing yeah, that's from the other room. Yeah, <laughs> that's all you needed. He didn't have to say anything. Then you know you didn't clean your shit up. Yeah, you, you, you were not clean. Because yeah. the mom went in and said, dude, wait till your father gets yeah. home. <laughs> yeah. And you could hear the snap of the belt, dude, from the other room. Yeah. And you start crying, right? <laughs> yeah. You start crying right there. And then right. you're like, if I cry enough, I may not get the belt. Yeah. <laughs> Hence, you get the belt. Yeah. Anyway, those were good, the good old days. Yeah. You know. Hey, my friends down the street used to have to kneel on rice. Oh, man. <laughs> I, I'd, I'd rather take the belt. <laughs> That's what I said. I'll take the belt. And I'm like, let me see that kneeling on rice. Okay. Dude, you kneel on rice within yeah. a minute, dude. That rice is cutting into your yeah. knees. Yeah, and you know Mexicans use long grain rice, so that's even. Oh more. yeah, no, and it was you know you know exactly what I'm saying. They were straight from it, dude. And uh, no, man, that was that was I didn't want the rice. <laughs> the rice is not good. But words are important. Yeah, yeah, words are important. So let's go back to before we took this little break with the battery. Uh, we're talking about Tupac, and uh, mm. next year is what 25 years since his death. Mm. I know it's not necessarily something you want to celebrate, but. You know, um, yeah, just yeah. looking back on your experience with him, what, you know, what do you remember that maybe the the person, you know, uh, investigating online about you and him and what you did together and the music you made together, yeah. what are the things that are missing in regards to what do you think is missing? Uh, let me see. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to grab that question. It's, a, it's kind of deep, right? A little philo- I don't know what... Not necessarily what's... philosophical, but like... You know, if I type in Ronnie King, Tupac Shakur, and whatever pops up, I can read it. And obviously that, you know, but there, is there anything missing that people don't understand about him as a person, his music, uh, the, the time you spent with him? Is there anything well, missing? Well, I mean, I, th- I think, I mean, I think all that you've read probably is, is, is pretty close to what normal people had a relationship with him, you know. I was a brother in arms, you know, so we had a different kind of relationship, you know. Um, I just saw a thing on on the YouTube where one of his famous speeches about, you know, there's eight rappers in the room, everybody wants to be on the track, but nobody's got their thing together. And it's like, look, dude, we don't have time for all this. Right. You, you know, you get called up, you go in there, you cut it a couple, two, three times, and you're out. Right. You know, but a lot of guys, he like, oh, you guys are all wiling out, drinking and smoking and dude, and you're just not on your game. He goes, let the guys in the studio who like the studio, there's guys in the, like, like to be in the studio and stuff. But he says, we don't have time for all that. I got to have this record done in two weeks, dude. I'm, and, and that was his thing. I know a lot of people talk about his work ethic and try to explain that, you know, because everybody's like, oh, dude, you know, I mean, we would do eight or nine tracks in a day. You know, that's a lot of material. So, you know, a lot of people have talked about that. And a lot of people have talked about uh, his work ethic. But he was intentional about his time. Like, that was the thing, you know. It's like he was a prophet that knew he was, it was short in a way because of what he was saying and how he was saying it i think he knew his time was going to be a short one he was either going to get knocked off because he's already been shot how many times before that yeah. anyway right you know what i mean and i i didn't think that he would think that he wouldn't you know and he always had to be very you know cautious with where he went and what he did and all that but it wasn't like easy easy died from you know hiv or aids or whatever it was some disease you know so it was weird because in my life it's like 
these were the these guys were the guys that were going to take us through our careers and take us to the bank too and right. we were going to be a part of something you know right but they all died easy died oh my god that crew was so t you know like no this can't be happening you know and then when Pac and biggie and all these people left too it's like those were the guys that were making the movement happen and then people had to go and keep their movement happening right so that's if there's anything missing i would say that the prophets kind of know that they're here for a short amount of time me myself i always knew i was going to be a late bloomer <laughs> i did I, I i just just by the way i navigated my life it's like I like the studio and stuff, but I like golf too. Yeah. <laughs> Very strategic. Yeah. You know, I like the studio, but I like vacationing too. Yeah. And those are both things that take up a lot of my time. And I always tell everybody, I work for vacation. My whole life has always been, I, I am successful so I can be on vacation, travel with my wife and with my people and take people like, it was so funny, you know, I love taking people out on the boat or on the sailboat or, yeah. you know what I mean? And see their eyes light up and just like, this is the most amazing thing ever. That's what Tupac really did for me too. Every time I was in the studio, my, I was like, is this cat really bringing that kind of energy? Like, oh, you know, and it wasn't a negative, energy. it was just such a higher realm of thinking, you know, yeah. I thought. Yeah. And if that, if there's anything that's missing, probably and i know they were trying to get to the metaphysical with him and they've said it a little bit but i think the other stuff shadows overshadows him a bit but he was very metaphysical you know he was into machiavelli man yeah this cat was a reader he was raised you know his mom was phenomenal you know so for me if there was anything missing it was the fact that he was in a spiritual bubble that obviously changed the face of music. And the end result was a lot of people made a lot of money, Yeah. right? But it, at that particular time, it was about, man, he wanted to flush that music out. That's why he did eight songs a day, you know? Right. Get it out, get it out, get it out. Let, let the guys at the studio mess around with it. Let Ronnie King sit here all night if he wants and put new keyboards on and Johnny J, the producer, and all the other guys, oh, let them put them, you know? But I would say that would probably be the biggest thing is that he, he it's kind of like something when you know it's going to happen at some point. You know what I mean? It's kind of like, I know I'm going to eat dinner tonight. You kind of think that. Right, right. You know what I mean? Or something. Or something you do, I, I know I'm going to work today. Yeah. And I'm, you know, his was, but, but then if you put it in the spiritual realm, yeah. uh, he knew he had to say a lot of stuff. What's the favorite track you played on for, a little liquor. for him? Um, you know what? I just saw one the other day that I hadn't heard in a long time, and it's called The Life I Live. And I had forgotten all about it. It was on the Better Days uh, record. Mm -hmm. And it had The Outlaws in it. It had Big Psych in it. I always love seeing Big Psych. But uh, The Life I Live, man. The, and I forgot, I mean, it really, I mean, it's a classic. It's a classic Tupac song. It's just about the life I live. It's about, yeah. man, it's, it's deep. It's deep. But I saw someone posted it on like a Tupac, I don't know. I wasn't even following the people on the thing, you know. Yeah. That's what I love about the internet, too. Stuff pops out. And I'm like, that sounds like me on that song. And then I got to remember, okay, let me go check the credits out. And hence, Jerry Heller, thank you very much. Make sure they spell your name right on the credits. Because <laughs> yeah. then they can't take that away from you. Right. You know what I mean? So all the conversations are, bro, how much money did you make? And obviously, I made some right. doing something. Right. You know, and when they put you, when they keep you on the credits and they spell your name right, that's a good thing. So I looked down and was like, that is me. And then I sat down and then I started thinking about the recording session. We were in Atlanta at Stankonia Studios, that's where uh, Outkast, and Bubba Sparks, remember Bubba Sparks, the white rapper? Um, but that was their studio, Stankonia, and we recorded that there. 
And it was, um, yeah, it was trippy. That was a trippy one. But yeah, that was my, one of my latest that I like. I like a lot of them at different yeah. times. But, you know, all these, you know what's happening? The 20-year cycle is happening. My dad, I say, hey, there's a 20-year cycle. All right, 20-year cycle what? You just have to live long enough to get to the 20-year cycle. You live long enough, you get to see right. that, you right. know? It, yeah, things come around, yeah. And, and, and then get, they come around, they're relevant again. They're like, oh, wow, that was really... And so now I see all this stuff on the internet where it's like, what music was better? The Tupac, you know, Biggie, Puff Daddy era, or what they're doing now? Right. And, what they, and what was really interesting is a real smart guy, I didn't know who he was. He goes, back then you used to listen to the lyrics and not so much to the beat. Now... The beat is what they listen to, and the lyrics are like, whatever. Right. They're yeah, because think of that song. What's the song that uh, came with those two female rappers that came out with the song and became number one oh, for Cardi several B. weeks? Yeah. yeah. You know, obviously the lyrics are very... Sexual. Sexual, and, yeah. uh, you know... And it's saying nothing, really. I mean, yeah, and yeah. The, but it's the beat. Right, the beat, yeah. So that's the difference. Tupac would recite stories and put you in a rose from a concrete, hit them up, you know, whatever. It was. Biggie used to be a lyricist. You know, these were lyricists, you know, and then uh, it just switched. And it's, I mean, I love, I love all music. Yeah, and it, um, it'll come back. Lyrics will be important again, you know. Lyrics will be important. Well, the, the people that are bringing lyrics to the forefront is the scene I'm in with uh, the reggae scene. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that, that mass manipulation album that you played on with Steel Pulse has a lot of, you know, underlying tones and uh, all these things about what we're doing to the earth and, you know, I mean, really great album. Yeah, yeah. Great album. Uh, they, and, and we got to see them play in Indio at the, um, what was it, the Desert Oasis Music Festival? Remember they played here? I did. I didn't, yeah. I didn't get to see them at that yeah. time. I think I was living out of town maybe at the time. Yeah. Yeah, Steel Pulse, they're fantastic. But yeah, talk about lyrics. I mean, they had a song, Human Trafficking, which was way before that Epstein dude story came out yeah right and then they had then they had one uh the uh, i played on a song called um the world's gone mad yeah that's a great song way before the freaking pandemic yeah <laughs> right i mean foretelling yeah. the future almost maybe foretelling i mean and that's what artists do when they're tapped in they're tapped in yeah you know, so uh, that's another, you know, and, and why I get to be in these rooms is, is I'm hoping that it's my intention to be there, you know. And I think, and I also do believe that it's um, working with artists that are just coming up, you know, like we do here in the desert, you know. Yeah. Kristen Lee. Kristen Lee, four She's to five, great. these really great artists that can be really great, you know. Peace, love, and happiness. That, yeah. Not a bad, a great song. I love the lyrics. It's fantastic. Yeah. Hey, maybe we, maybe we hit the mark. Maybe we didn't hit the mark. But the song is fantastic. Right. I think somewhere in the world that song will either be recorded again right. or it'll start moving again or right. whatever it might be, you know. Yeah. You never know with the song. Like I say, I got... The song I wrote 20 years ago with Latoya Linden. I mean, yeah. you just never know when these songs are going to hit. And speaking of songs, Bob Dylan sold his whole catalog for $300 million. Is that all? $300 million? Yeah. It's a lot of money. <laughs> it's a lot of songs. That's a lot of songs. But you know what? Songs are good. So keep writing songs and own your publishing. Yeah. He couldn't have done that. But see, he lived long enough to get all revert the publishing back to him. Right, right. Yeah, and you mentioned earlier about, you know, having those last years where you can actually enjoy uh -huh. the money and not have to necessarily work well, so hard. Well, if you stick around long enough, it just compounds. Yeah. You know, and you're making more records. Your, your catalog is getting bigger. And you're still being relevant. I mean, and then you're making then you're making a career off of things that don't even have anything to do with those records, really. I mean, then people are like, "Man, we just want to hear about your experience." That's why I sit on these board of directors with all these colleges. It's like they already get the fact that the music has been done. They want to know how I'm thinking about it now, and how can they relay that? to another generation, you know? Because, 
the music business is exactly the same. Everybody, oh, the music business has changed so much. No, it's a gangsterish business. Yeah. It's all about who owns it, who wrote it, how now the writers are yeah. owning more, which is good. Right. But then if you don't want to own more, like Bob Dylan, he didn't want to own, he didn't want to own any more than the 25% that he got to own on his mechanicals. But if he lived long enough, every 10 years, then he's got 50. Then he's got 75 or whatever. I mean, I'm sure now he owned probably 75% of his royalties and the record companies only had 25%. Right. But the record companies are going, wait a minute. If we give him $300 million, we can have 100% of the whole freaking thing. Right. He's still going to get his mechanical royalties. Right. He's still going to win and make lots of money. Right. But then now he's got this big chunk and he's like, I'm 70 years old. What am I going to do with $300 million? Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, that looks like a big plane. And he can do what Drake did. What did and Drake do? Drake got a, uh, what, 737? <laughs> so he's flying around on a 737 right now. You know, but he sold a lot of records, yeah. you know? And, and you know what? I think we all know that let's have fun while we're here because we're not going to be here forever. Our time is short for sure. Oh, and a shout out to my boy, Romulo Conicellis. Uh, they're having his funeral today. He died last week, but one of the best Latino PR men in Hollywood. And I saw that they were doing his, uh, you know, drive by memorial thing or whatever. And they have, it's so cool. They have a big picture of him with, you know, the backdrop because no one can really mingle or whatever. And then they have a red carpet with the rope and everything. Oh, that's cool. That, that was him. He could walk you into the Grammys. He can, ah, I've been with him so many times where it's like, he goes, I, oh, I don't have any tickets for anything, but let's go see. And he'd show up, they'd be like, <laughs> he's like, come on. You know, he was, he was, he was back from the old school. Right. He don't need no stinking badges. <laughs> and that's why everybody's like, dang, all my juice is gone. <laughs> that was the dude that could just walk you in anywhere, dude. I mean, really, Fanta, he introduced me to Marty Settlement and many other great Hollywood people, you know, yeah. that one guy, you know, and he was always, you know, funny with him. He was always trying to make that next big deal, you know, yeah. but he was always present. He, would, he knew connecting people was how he was going to win again, you know. Yeah. But we're not here forever. That's not yeah. So what's what are your plans for the end of the year? What are you doing beginning of next year? Anything in the works? I'm uh, going to start my podcasting and I'm going to do some stuff like that just to kind of do that. Yeah. Um, and I'm playing with uh, David Electri uh, as well from Steel Poles. Um, I know I'm missing a bunch of stuff, uh, but those are all the ones that are definitely signed, sealed and delivered. Nice. Oh, the Bradley Knowles record. Yeah, uh, there's yeah. another one. Volume two comes out after the first of the year. Okay. Um, and those records are fantastic. They're selling like hotcakes too, yeah. which is great. Uh, so the Naughty Don, Kaleo and I group, uh, we have like two, two songs on each, on each record with the Pepper songs too. Yeah. So that's good. So we got like three or four tracks on the, the rec those records are going to do good. Hopefully by summer, you know, summer tour season can start again. Right. Um, I am going to Ibiza. I'm sitting on a, on a um, board um, of a big music conference that's going on in uh, May. And I'll be doing a lot of that too. Uh, UCI in Costa Rica. I sit on the board of uh, Emerson College as a global advisory board. Mm -hmm which I'm going to go do some seminars with them. With the book coming out, maybe I'll do some signings. book signings and talking about the book more live if that, you know, if live stuff happens. But if not, all that's coming out. And I'm basic, I'm really going to enjoy setting up my internet presence like I've never ever done before. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to have my own store, stuff nice. like that. You know, have a... You know, I have a real internet presence because my internet presence has, has just been me doing it on my phone the whole time. Having a great right. time doing it. I love right. it. Right. Um, but I think there's a lot of information that needs to be told now while right. I'm still here. Right. Um, I think that will help my company grow 
and I want to just grow my company into something really cool where I can help musicians more. Yeah. You know, like I told one of my business partners, man, if I, if I financed every great artist that I love, I'd be broke. Because I love so many. I mean, you talk about Kristen, you talk about, you know, Mike House, you talk about, you know, I mean, so many of them have like so much, so much potential, you know? Right. But I, I as much as my heart wants to have them in this studio every day, churning and burning, you know, right. I need to start a corporation that will be able to allow that to happen. And right. that's what I'm doing too, is maybe get that, part of the thing going, you know, yeah. get a little bit more corporate life. But in that, and I've done that before, I've owned my own labels and stuff, it takes me away from what I really love to do. So I have to be not yeah. careful, but I want to, I'm, hey man, travel while you're young, right. play music while you're young, uh, keep making great music. I mean, the things that I love to do, if I can put a good enough team together to do all this craziness, uh, then I think it'd be great. I'd love to have it established here in the desert. I'd love to see the, the, the Coachella Valley music scene flourish. The IPAC. Yeah, IPAC. I mean, that should be a place for musicians, about musicians, having a board of directors, yeah. having a bank account, making things happen so bands can come in right. and build their fan base up and be able to get paid for it, have a bank account that can keep it going, have some smart, you know, executive run the thing from afar, you know, let some young college kids run the venue. I mean, what a, what a great extension of like a university to have their own venue that young artists can run a venue. Right, I agree, yeah. It started with Golden Voice. They used to, back in 90, 91, they used to just book us at the freaking Roxy. Yeah. They weren't all Coachella and all that. Right. All of them. They were just barely hanging on and they were cool. I'm not saying them barely hanging on is just whatever that means, but <laughs> they were they were hustling, man. Right. They were booking the freaking glass house in Riverside. Yeah. It's like a 200 seater place. Right. But they needed that work. They needed that stuff. They needed all that. So it'd be neat maybe with the university or an extension of the college or something where that could be a place where someone learns how to throw a show. Right. You know? And then the bands can flourish because of like, that's my night. I want my night to look like this. Right. Could be a punk rock show. The next night I want to make it a rap night. I want right. to make it a this. Well, what do you think is preventing the city from doing that? What's... I don't know enough of politics about the city, but... Well, any municipality, why, why wouldn't any... Was it a municipality that didn't make it happen? Because I know it was opened. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know who, why it didn't stay. Because I think it was an individual or something that wanted to do it right. Okay. And then I understood that the Golden Voice guys were going to get in there and want to do it for like a little after party place for Coachella right. or whatever. Right. And then, yeah. But that's too big. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about kids that are just fresh out of college, man, that are like, look, dude, this is your night. You promote it. Like what I'm doing with Emerson College. I'm working with young kids that are going to communication school at one of the prestigious, you know, called not only is Emerson a prestigious school. I think uh, Jay Leno went there. A lot of people that went there. That says it all. He's big. He has yeah. a lot of cars stuff he's done well right no but i mean they're communication people right so i'm excited because my whole world's going to change with those guys but that's part of this great team but to have somebody who can like train these kids how to run a show how to get the tickets and da 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 and, ba, 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 and then feed it to the bands so the bands could feed and bands go hey look well i'm not behind the eight ball every time i play right how can bands play if they feel they're behind the eight ball the whole time right or if they're playing for, you know, what, beer and pizza? I don't know. I guess that does work, but that's, that doesn't get people. Right. I worked for beer and pizza on the freaking boardwalk of Venice Beach <laughs> with my brothers. That was yeah. a great time. That was actually, actually, that was a great time because people didn't want to hear you. But we'd go in front of these things. We have a little boom box and I have a little keyboard. 
and I'd plug it into like a battery. Was it, was it a battery powered? No, I would get the, no, I guess it was a battery powered amp or it was a battery powered keyboard and I plugged it into the <laughs> boom box. That's what it was. And we would sit there in front of this one pizza joint. They're like, dude, you guys sound really good. You stay there all day and we'll give you freaking pizza all day long. Nice. And we'd come home with like a hundred bucks in tips. Nice. You know what I mean? So yeah. it's something kind of the mentality would be that. Right. It's like, that's because we wanted to be there and we wanted to shine. And that pizza guy said, look, that's your spot. You come any weekend, I'll make sure no one's going to play there. Right. Right. So then that place and maybe maybe downtown indio just isn't there yet but why can't you do it somewhere else i know like the hood or some venue whatever the venue would be if it was connected to some kind of university or something yeah and i swear to god you don't even have to sell booze i don't think that club in riverside the glass house they don't sell no they don't sell any booze Underage clubs don't sell booze, but you'll get 300 young punk rock kids in there. I used to go around the country and there'd be no booze in the freaking club at all, but there'd be 300 kids tussling it up, you know, but we can do it in the desert. I mean, it just takes, it's just going to take some, you know, some accounting yeah. people or something like that. There's no shortage of creativity. Right. Yeah. That's, you know. that's a great point. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of these guys that are smart in business and stuff like that, and they can put their money into something that they feel good about. I love the fact people give money to churches, kind of like a thing like that. Right. You know, give it to a, a responsible human being that can watch after it. That's what churches do, right? Right, yeah. I mean, they give it to a... The Lord. A they give it to the Lord, but, but within no, no, the Lord, you. they have a group of real human beings that right. sit there and cut the checks. Oh, yeah. You know, so if we can find some responsible people and it don't have to be about booze and it don't have to be about all that stuff. It could just be about the music and the training. Right. Yeah. So anyways, I can't do it all in one interview, but <laughs> I think you have. You pretty much solved all the world's problems. <laughs> I put it out there. I, I, I appreciate you having me on, on one of your first shows. Of course. Yeah. I, I love uh, telling some of the old stories are great. It's good to hear. Um, this is the new story, I guess, that we're here in front of the new podcast studio. Yeah, yeah. That's a new story. That's a new story. Um, a new story is all the great records that are coming out uh, that I'm involved with. And the, and the great bands, man. Yeah. Music is coming back in a great way. And you see it on the internet where people are playing live. It's not all. Even, have you seen these guys with the drum machines? They're sitting there and they're tapping a whole freaking arrangement out on the. That's creative. Yeah. I sit there. And I'm like, how does that guy know? I mean, it could be. And all of the sounds aren't necessarily beat mapped out to where it's like, OK, everything's yeah. on the one. You right. got to, like, get your funk. Right. I mean, it's amazing. Yeah. I love it. Well, when, when are you going to do a live, sh a live show or a live feed? Soon. You know what I want to do? I want to do a jazz show from Chateau Relaxo. That'd be cool. Yeah. Yeah. Who would, you, who would you get in here? To play with you. To Pat play. Rizzo. Pat Rizzo. My boy T. Barlesco. Okay. Who is fantastic. They've played in this desert forever. Uh, one of my new friends, Noresto Torres, who plays the flute. He's, he's very big. He's a Grammy-winning flute, flute out, flutist. Um, starting, let me just start with those three guys. Yeah, that'd be great. And just to have him come down, enjoy a day in the, you know, have it all COVID, have it in the front yard, and, and just play some jazz and, and make, it, make it just about the jazz, you know? So soon. That'd be great. I know Kaleo and I are going to be doing shows. Uh, like that, we're yeah. gonna we're gonna be doing some of these live podcasty type shows. And what's that setup like with you and him with uh, with Naughty Don? We just get down. I mean, we get down. However, man, it's just like whatever. He'll call me one day and go, "Dude, let's do this. You want to do this?" That's how the whole thing started. We started recording the Naughty Don 14 years ago. Wow. So the first time we wrote, we wrote on the boat. Then we were like. 
this is pretty fun. And he'd go on tour, I'd go on tour, we'd get da 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 da. And then when we get off tour, everybody gets off tour, boom, 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 and we go right, again, we go right on the boat. So we, the, the inception of it was on the boat. Hmm. Then Paul Leary heard it, who was the producer of Sublime, um, Butthole Surfers, all this. He's like, you guys get down to my studio. And then it grew from that. And then we'd go to LA and everybody that heard the music was like, we want to be a part of it. And then so like this record has so many guys on it. It's fantastic. And then the last part of this, when we decided to kind of put the screws to it and sign to Law Records is um, two of my friends that were DJs. We were like, I tell them, because I coined the phrase many years ago. I said, this is like electric beach. It's like, you'll go to your pepper show and enjoy this organic whatever. Right. But then when you get done, you want to go to the club and you want to like hang out. And so that's where you would hear the Naughty Don. Okay. So it's not dance hall, but it's, I call it electric beach. You know, it's kind of like pepper and it's like Kaleo and Ronnie King together, meshing stuff together, yeah. but it's definitely club. Yeah. Definitely popping, but we do stuff acoustically all the time, and it's just like we did a thing for Bradley's house. This the first record we did yeah. um, at D Piazza's in Long Beach, as a matter of fact. And we went up there, and we were playing, and freaking Raz One got up and goes, "Dude, can I play guitar with you guys?" I mean, like, it's like it's infectious with me and Kalea. We just we just play very well together. I don't know. And um, so yeah, so it's just it's a jam session, man. Life is a jam session. Nice. So that's the thing. Yeah. So anyways, but I do want to do a, like a COVID thing because I know it's going to be happening. But maybe we can get you involved in helping promote it of and course. something. And yeah. I and it, make it super VIP. You know, right. You know. Yeah. Bring your pocketbook. You're going to see the greatest musicians that you're going to see during COVID right. in the desert. Right. So that right there. That'd be great. Man. And there's a lot of thousand dollar fucking bills out there. Don't you think a couple yeah. that couple would go, you know what, I can go support something. Maybe we give right. some to the church, to right. the native, uh, you know, my, 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 my res over here right. towards Martinez right. for the kids or for the mental health and wellness right. that you deal with some kind of something where we can give, you know, 20%, 25% to something. Right, because yeah, jazz is you know, that that it's a he, there's a lot of healing properties in jazz. Jazz is like so free form, and it's jazz is good. Maybe we'll get Tarver Marsh's guy who plays the stirring oh, bowls. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it could be that cool. Yeah. Like the guy with the stirring bowls can start yeah. the jazz off. Yeah, why not? And then I'll get there with the cue ball. I'll, I'll I'll play with the stirring <laughs> yeah. bowls. Yeah. You know, but something like that. I want it to be that fun, that friendly, that 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 much fun. I want that I want the concert to be that. Yeah. So and I want people to share, you know, what hey, if you don't play the bass, you don't play the guitar, you don't play the drums, you don't sing, you're not in the band. So the only way for you to be in the band is to bring your cash. Right. Yeah. <laughs> True. Right? I mean what how else can you engage in it? I mean, you can just show up and be a lump and just yeah. get free music, but that's not cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Be a part of the band. Right. Invest in something here in the desert. Yeah, exactly. You know. Yeah. So. All right. Is there anything else you want to talk about, man? Anything else on your mind? Anything man, you want to put out I'm, there? You want to promote? No, I'm good. I'm, I'm exhausted, really. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you need took, some more tea, bro. You took me down memory lane. Dude, that's always tough with anybody, I think. Yeah. You know, going down memory lane. Because you think and you go, wow, if Tupac was still alive, I wonder, you know, they do a lot of that. Right. I wonder if he was still here. I wonder what his music would sound like. It's like... Yeah, what, it's, yeah that's almost like a, I don't know, slapping the face on his legacy already. Because, I mean, obviously he knew what he was doing. And oh, yeah, way ahead. But then you would like be like, wow, would I be in a scene? Would I be even a part of that? Am I even there? Yeah. You know, and that's a whole nother story yeah. for me. About I think every everything happened as it's supposed to happen. And yeah, and and that's just the, the time for it. Tragedy and success. Like it's, you know. Yeah. Hey, uh, I'm, I'm good right here. The wife's happy. We're stoked. We love to travel together. She's a great traveler. 
And uh, she's a big part of the business, man. She's a big part of the new dream, too. So, I'm excited. Cool, man. Well, I want to thank you for, for allowing us here into Chateau Relaxo and your home and your pool. You know, myself and, and, and Zach are appreciative of you and all the things you do. And exactly. hopefully, hopefully this, like, puts to light even more so the things that you're planning to do and, yeah. the, and the things that, you know, that you still hold true. Uh, you're from Indio. I'm from Indio. I'm from, man! I'm from Mega Vineyards. You're from, you know, the south side. So it's like, uh, you know... Um, Good, good guys doing good, and that's what matters. So that's right, it. and that's all we got. Thank you, sir. Coachella de Valle. Ronnie King. Still Ronnie King dot com. Ronnie King official. Uh, it's Ronnie King official dot com. Yeah, Ronnie yep, King yep. official dot com. Yep, that's where you can go, and uh, I love it. Let's do more. Keep up with them. Think so. Nice. Wow. Nice.